The learning target for this lesson is to explain how and why the ailerons work differently if their portion of the wing is stalled. You'll learn that ailerons don't work very well if their portion of the wing is stalled, and we'll go over why in this lesson, and then in the next lesson we'll go over the solution that aircraft designers use to make um, airplanes, the aileron controls, work through a higher angle of attack than they otherwise would. The inner part of the wing here is called the wing root. You can think of the root as the area of the wing that grows out of the fuselage. And then towards the wing tips, you have the ailerons, and the ailerons are the flight control that controls roll. So the way the ailerons work is by changing the amount of lift that each wing creates. If the wings are creating a different amount of lift, then one wing's going to drop and the other wing's going to rise, and that will cause you to roll. So how do the ailerons change the amount of lift that each wing creates? They do it by changing the angle of attack so that the angle of attack on each wing is different. If you remember, the angle of attack is the angle between the cord line of the wing, the line straight line from the leading edge to the trailing edge, and the relative wind, which is the wind opposite the flight path. So in this example, the wing is moving sideways along the bottom of your screen there, and the line on the bottom is the relative wind opposite the direction of movement, and you see there's three different angles of attack depending on where the aileron's position. So you've got a 30 degree angle here, 25 degree angle here, and a 20 degree angle here. Here, we have a chart that shows how lift changes with different angles of attack. So you see it's got zero lift at a negative five degree angle of attack. That tells you it's an asymmetric airfoil, meaning the top and bottom are different because a symmetric airfoil would have zero degrees lift at a zero degree angle of attack. But as you increase your angle of attack here on the x-axis, your lift increases on the y-axis until you reach your critical angle of attack. For this airplane, it looks like about 18 degrees. And then if you increase your angle of attack above that point lift starts to decrease again. The way that the ailerons change the angle of attack is by changing the cord line by changing the trailing edge. So the cord line is a straight line from the leading edge of the wing to the trailing edge of the wing. The ailerons change where the trailing edge is so that changes the cord line. The angle of attack is the angle between that cord line and the relative wind. So if you're changing the angle of the cord line, you're going to change the angle of attack. And you can see the example here. The original cord line with the ailerons um, in their central position has an angle right here of 25 degrees. If you lower the aileron, it goes up to an angle of 30 degrees. And if you raise the aileron, it goes down to an angle of 20 degrees, all with the same relative wind. So if you're operating at a lower angle of attack, like say 10 degrees, the whole wing's at 10 degrees, then the aileron going down would increase the angle of attack, that would cause more lift, and it would raise that wing. The aileron going up would decrease the angle of attack, it would cause less lift, and it would lower that wing, and that would cause the airplane to roll and then turn in that direction. But if we get past our critical angle of attack, past that angle of attack that gives us the maximum possible lift at that airspeed, then changing the angle of attack is going to work backwards. We'll start out here in the black. We'll say that's a 25 degree angle of attack you see down here. Airplane stalled, but it's still generating a fair amount of lift. It's still generating as much as you would uh, generate at a 14 degree angle of attack. So you should still be able to fly like that. The problem is that now if you lower your aileron, which would normally increase the angle of attack and increase lift, still going to increase your angle of attack. Um, it's going to go to this red 30 degrees. You see it moves this down to 30 degrees, but now you actually lost lift. And so that wing is going to drop instead of climbing. And the opposite happens on the aileron going up. It's decreasing the angle of attack, which would normally decrease the lift to make that wing drop and the airplane roll and turn in that direction. But now when the aileron goes up, you're, you're getting closer to the critical angle of attack, which means you're getting closer to that optimum maximum lift angle. And so you're actually going to increase the amount of lift. Once you exceed this critical angle of attack, if the ailerons are stalled, then when the pilot 
rolls right on the controls, the airplane's actually going to roll left. And that's a very dangerous situation because you never want the airplane to do the opposite of what the pilot's trying to tell it to do. The learning target for this lesson is to understand how aircraft designers fix the problem with the ailerons that we talked about in the last lesson. So the target is to list and explain the methods aircraft designers use to keep the ailerons working correctly during an initial start. You want the airplane to be controllable through as high of an angle of attack as possible. And the way that they do that um, are wing washout, camber, vortex generators, and platform selection, which is the shape of the wing if you view it from the top. And so we'll talk about each of these things in the slides going forward. The main way that aircraft designers make sure that a wing stalls at the root before it stalls at the tips, which is what keeps the ailerons effective, is by something called the wing washout, which is basically a twist so that the tips of the wing are always at a lower angle of attack than the roots, and therefore the roots are always going to stall first. They're always going to hit that critical angle of attack and pass it before the tip does, and hopefully the airplane will then pitch down before the tip and the part with the ailerons ever actually stalls. And that prevents the aileron from ever working backwards like we talked about in the last lesson. This picture looks at wing washout or wing twist from a different perspective. It's showing two cutouts of the airfoil. The large one's what it looks like at the wing root and the small one's at the wing tip. And you can see there's a two degree difference between the cord lines of each airfoil section which means that the root is always at a two degree higher angle of attack than the tip, and the, the root will therefore stall first and hopefully lose enough lift for the aircraft to pitch down before the tip with the aileron ever stalls. The disadvantage to wash out is that if the different parts of the wing are at different angles of attack, then it's impossible to get the entire wing at the most efficient angle of attack at the same time. But because wing washout is usually fairly small, that's usually not a large problem. Another possibility is to use camber to do more or less the same thing as wing washout. The more camber an airfoil has, the higher its critical angle of attack, or the higher angle of attack it can go to before it stalls. If you make the wing less cambered at the root and more cambered at the tip, that will ensure that the wing stalls at the root first. Another way that you can ensure the wing root stalls before the wing tip is with stall strip. And a stall strip is just something you attach to the leading edge of the wing in the place you want it to stall first. At a low angle of attack, it doesn't do much. The airflow is separating before it really gets to that point anyway. So at a low angle of attack, it makes very little difference. It's probably slightly less efficient. But at a high angle of attack, close to the critical angle of attack, the airflow is actually splitting below that stall strip on the leading edge. And that stall strip then acts kind of like a spoiler and it causes the airflow to separate before it normally would at a lower angle than it normally would and ensures wherever you put the stall strip will stall first. So they put it at the wing root so it stalls before the tip. The advantage to a stall strip versus wing washout or changing the camber is the stall strip's really cheap. So it's a lot simpler to do than twisting the wing and you usually see it on cheaper aircraft. The opposite of a stall strip are these right here. They're called vortex generators. And I'm not going to get into exactly how they work, but they create a vortex or like a tornado of air spiraling backwards from each one that adds energy to the layer of air right on the top of the wing. And it keeps it attached further back on the wing than it would otherwise be at. So it delays that separation point we talked about a couple of lessons ago and therefore allows that part of the wing to go to a higher angle, higher critical angle of attack before it stalls. So if you put them in front of the ailerons, they'll keep the ailerons effective even as the root stalls if they're not in front of the root. Sometimes though, aircraft manufacturers will put these along the entire leading edge. That allows the whole wing to go to a higher angle of attack before it stalls. But if you do that, then you're gonna have to also use something like wing washout to make sure that the root stalls first and your ailerons stay effective. The wing platform is the shape of the wing as viewed from above. And different wing platforms have different stall characteristics. Some of you guys did a handout on this the last week of school, but for those of you who didn't, I'll go over a few of them. The rectangular wing has really good stall characteristics. 
even without any wing washout or twist, it stalls at the root first. And so it's a good training um, aircraft and it's cheap to make because it, you don't have to put in the twist. Um, it's not a very high performing wing. It's not very efficient, but on low cost training aircraft, it's one of the most commonly used wings. Here is one of the most efficient wings available. The Spitfire was a really famous fighter, um, British fighter in World War II that used this kind of wing. It tends to stall really suddenly and all at once though. So it's considered to have bad stall characteristics and, and stalls in that airplane can be relatively dangerous. The swept wing that airlines use also have bad stall characteristics. And that's because they stall on the tip before they stall on the root. And with this wing platform that's so pronounced that in aircraft manufacturers aren't really able to fix it with washout or um, vortex generators or anything like that. And another problem with it stalling at the tip on this airplane is you actually lose lift at a part of the airplane that's relatively backwards. So if we say it's lifting from right there, if we lose that part of the wing, your center of lift would actually move forwards. And if it moves forwards, that's gonna cause the airplane to pitch up even more. So whereas most airplanes, when they stall, they automatically by themselves pitch down, which tends to unstall them, a swept wing, if it stalls, will want to pitch up more. And so that can lead them into a deep stall where they're way over their critical angle of attack. And that can be really dangerous. The CRJ that I flew had this kind of a wing and it had um, really bad stall characteristics. When the test pilots actually stalled it for certification, they lost 10,000 feet of altitude, which means they fell about two miles. Normally, you should be able to recover from a stall in about 100 feet. So they lost 100 times as much altitude as an uh, airplane with good stall characteristics would. To prevent that from happening, airplanes with a swept wing like this have something called a stick pusher. And that's a system of a sensor and a computer and then a little motor that it will sense when the airplane's approaching its critical angle of attack. And before it actually stalls, the motor will push the controls forward to lower the nose and prevent the airplane from ever actually stalling. So it makes it impossible for the pilot to stall the airplane because the computer will actually, for just a second, take control of the airplane and push the nose down before it reaches a stall. So those are the main ways that aircraft manufacturers deal with bad stall characteristics, either to keep the ailerons effective in a stall or to prevent the airplane from reaching a stall in the first place.